Welcome to this video, Understanding the Grand Challenges in SES Modeling. I'm Sondus Sesawah, an Associate Professor at University of New South Wales, Canberra. My work focuses on advancing the science and practice of systems thinking and systems modeling, and especially their applications in socio-environmental technological systems. This tutorial is based on an article published in 2020 by myself and colleagues in the Journal of Socio-Environmental Systems Modeling. It discusses what we consider the key challenges of modeling these complex systems, along with past and current efforts to overcome them. We organize these into eight major categories, each of which I will explain briefly. These span issues associated with building teams, use of data, dealing with uncertainty, influencing policy, and more. The first challenge addresses the team issue. Because modeling SES systems is best done with interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary teams, the first challenge can be significant. Namely, negotiating differences in individual values and perspectives among team members, as well as bridging epistemologies that differ among disciplines. Modeling SAS problems is particularly vexing because SAS problems fall into a class called wicked problems. This means there is no one way to view a SAS problem. What is one person's solution may be another person's problem. Further, how people conceptualize an SES associated with a problem can be quite different. Some see certain social dynamics as critical to model construction, while others may overlook those or view them as less important than biophysical dynamics. And for SES problems, differences can go beyond personal values and views because modeling requires diverse teams. Scholars from different disciplinary fields and often even stakeholders are part of the modeling team. They typically are different in their own disciplinary language, where a word used in one discipline can mean something entirely different to another disciplinary scholar. And perhaps even more daunting is that scholars often come with divergent theoretical and methodological lenses that may be hard for people outside their field to grasp or even to accept. Grand Challenge 2 is related to how uncertainty is treated when modeling SES. In the modeling literature, the main sources of uncertainty are often attributed to data, model structure and model parameters. But we know that this is a very partial view of uncertainty. Uncertainty sources extend beyond these model-only sources and pertain to every modeling choice, activity and product, intermediate and final, generated throughout the modeling process. If you think about every decision you make throughout the modeling process, starting with how you scope the problem, to who you involve in the problem framing, to the data sets you choose to include in understanding the problem, every choice along every step has an uncertainty attached to it. Sometimes we are aware of these uncertainties and their implications, and many other times we are not fully understanding how these uncertainties play out. While uncertainty cannot be avoided, it needs to be recognized, understood, and treated accordingly. And decisions made during the modeling process are not independent and cannot be simply treated in isolation. So this requires integrated treatment of uncertainty. In you look at both qualitative and quantitative sources of uncertainty in a holistic way. These include uncertainty associated with data, parameters, model structures, and all other choices. However, we are challenged in two ways. First, there has been limited adoption of integrated uncertainty assessment in practice. This may be attributed to insufficient practical guidelines for linking theory and practice with common and contextualized lessons around best approaches in how to incorporate uncertainty assessments. Second, there has been limited communication of uncertainty to decision makers. Although communication with decision makers and stakeholders about modeling uncertainty is a high priority, it remains a daunting task in SES modeling. Often, the metrics presented to decision makers 
are too complex and difficult to interpret in user-relevant ways. To tackle these issues, there are a number of directions we need to pursue. These range from moving beyond traditional quantitative methods to methods that are more integrative to capturing our assumptions and informing uncertainty analysis using new techniques. The third challenge is related to integrating qualitative and quantitative data, which is almost always required. As we mentioned earlier and emphasized, SES modeling brings together multiple disciplines, which may have different views even about what constitutes acceptable data. For example, narratives versus numbers. Some members will bring extensive qualitative information to the table, often social. Others may view qualitative data as unacceptable. The team has to learn to accept and respect different perspectives and scholarly traditions that team members bring to the project. This brings at least two challenges to the team. First, during the modeling process, the team will be exposed to a large amount of information, whether qualitative or quantitative, and they must determine the right balance between qualitative and quantitative data collection and model building. For certain studies, Narratives and qualitative assessments are better, and for others, detailed quantitative assessments may be important. This choice is determined by a number of factors, such as nature of the questions, the stakeholders, their needs and preferences. Some stakeholders may discount the value of the model if it doesn't show quantitative data. There is also the pragmatic aspects around time and resources. The second issue is related to integrating two forms of information requires implementing what we call mixed methods approach. This helps. However, we still don't have the guidance, standards, tools, and methods for integrating data from diverse sources. Moving forward to tackle these issues, we need to explore alternative designs for integrating data. For example, Parallel versus sequential designs use different approaches for comparing information from stakeholder interviews with results that are produced by the model. Additionally, modeling teams need to adopt methods for establishing common ontologies to couple models, tools, and data from different disciplines. This is called semantic mediation, and there is a great deal of information that teams can use to inform this process. The fourth challenge is focused on how to deal with the issues of scale mismatches. Socio-environmental systems operate across a variety of scales, spatial, temporal, and organizational scales. And dealing with scales in SES modeling is still a vexing challenge. Modeling teams are typically faced with the problem of how to link variables and processes that operate over very slow time scales with those that are much more dynamic. The same problem exists in how to link processes at global scales with those at regional scales. Representing and matching scales is not easy. Up-down scaling is used in ecological modeling and can include interpolation, use of special statistics, scale transition theory, or approximation by analytical modeling. However, such approaches are not widely used with social data and may not even be amenable. Additionally, different levels of knowledge and data about the social and the environmental subsystems exist at various scales. Environmental data may have a long history of observation, often enabled by automatic sensors delivering high-resolution data. Yet, high-resolution social data usually represent a single time interval, such as a survey or a post on social media. Since social panel data is expensive to collect and may be hindered by privacy issues. Ultimately, data availability drives what is to be represented in a social or environmental submodel and at what scale. Much like there are ways to compare methods for integrating data, there are methods for evaluating choices related to scale. In 2013, Shirley Tell presented a range of methods and how they could be used throughout the socio-ecological assessment process. Yet, 
we still need studies focused on the evaluation and comparison of different methodological choices related to scaling. And development of resources must be combined with readily available and user-friendly guides. Others are trying to develop multiple models at different scales and then somehow integrate them. This is called multi-scale modeling. And while it is well developed in many fields, such as material science, this is still in its infancy for SES modeling. Because socio-environmental systems are complex and nonlinear systems, fundamental changes in the behavior and or structure of these systems, also called systemic changes, can happen. The challenge is that capturing and representing these in SES models remain a vexing issue for modelers. This relates to two broad issues. First, we lack sufficient data on the basic processes that cause these shifts in social systems. Longitudinal socioeconomic and ethnographic data are not consistently measured over time and between cases. We know much more about this for natural systems, where, for example, dramatic shifts in aquatic ecosystems have been well studied. While much natural science data are compiled into open access data sets, there are barriers for doing this with socioeconomic data, including privacy concerns, the cost or effort of data collection, or inconsistency in measurements of the same phenomena and variables. The second issue relates to the fact that currently methods for modeling systemic changes are limited. The basic structure and feedbacks in models are affected by systemic changes, yet our current methods do not allow for changing these. The components of the system and the rules or equations for interactions are predefined. I would like to mention two promising directions for moving forward. By now, you can guess the first. We need much more research and data to understand social systems and their dynamics. Social science research has been vastly underfunded. The second direction is that we need advances in approaches for reasoning and modeling systemic changes. Gary Paul Hill and colleagues discussed this in more depth in a paper they published in Environmental Modeling and Software. The next grand challenge deals with how to integrate the human dimension into SES models. As we discussed in our grand challenges paper, there are mainly six approaches for doing this. They differ along multiple dimensions, including the way they incorporate feedback, the heterogeneity of social decisions, and data intensity. One reason this integration has been challenging is, once again, lack of funding is a serious problem for social science researchers. This means insufficient data and insufficient resources for supporting collaborations with environmental scientists. Another part of this challenge is that it is difficult to represent the actual decision-making process in models. SES modelers often access the outcomes of decision-making such as revealed preferences or indirect representations, such as stated preferences, but not the actual decision-making process itself. There are several ways to move forward on this challenge. First, we must move beyond the use of stylized theories to model individual human behavior and instead actually represent the entities that have disproportionate impacts on SES dynamics. For example, organizations, governmental entities, and business. Second, there is an urgent need to extend research that will help us generalize findings about human behavior and decision makers. That is to converge on generic modules to represent decisions in SES models. Computational social scientists are moving forward in data collection and modeling that may allow us one day, for example, to generalize based on cultural and socioeconomic context. Open access libraries for sharing human decision code components that are being developed would help us identify broad patterns, potentially as a function of environmental context. This brings us to challenge seven, namely 
A low uptake of SAS models in policy design and implementation is a major concern. There is a gap between model development and the actual use of models to support collaborative decision making. There are two major issues. First, the empirical evidence that SAS modeling has an impact on decision making is still limited. Sometimes we use participatory modeling approaches to engage decision makers in the modeling process, assuming that this will lead to learning and greater likelihood of an impact on decisions. Can we verify this? Even if it does have an impact, we must cope with scaling up beyond in-person interaction to include a broader representation of systems, knowledge, and values. There are passes forward, however. For example, while there are many methods and approaches for designing a participatory modeling process, as exemplified in this typology, efforts are underway to develop general guidelines for selecting among them to ensure for the inclusion of cultural differences in stakeholder engagement. Second, efforts are also underway to elucidate where models and other decision support tools and sources of evidence fit within the political spectrum. Finally, we are on Grand Challenge 8. This is focused on the growing availability of data, new technologies, and computational infrastructure for collecting, archiving, and sharing information. Today, we cannot only track human movements and communication, but synthesize diverse sources of heterogeneous data to provide insights into people's decisions and preferences. Far more is known about all of us than we, what we realize. Whereas all these technologies offer great opportunities for SES modeling, they also bring their own challenges. First, the flip side of the ability to capture individual data is the inevitable privacy issues such as breaches and risks. For example, many social and medical scientists were shocked to discover that machine learning methods can partially or completely re-identify individual subjects from data that was believed to have been de-identified sufficiently to be safe for public release. Second, there are more limitations with the new forms of data than people assume. For example, modeling tools, especially those that are data intensive, can easily become too obscure to be useful in an open and transparent deliberative decision-making process. Additionally, social media and mobile phone signals can provide data on locations and movements of millions of people, but not generally constitute a representative sample of the population. This brings us back to where we started, reflecting on the many challenges. While all what I have covered may seem daunting, remember that for each challenge there are ways to move forward, and more than what I have managed to mention. If we continue to grow the community of SAS modelers and bring more educational resources to students, as well as those new to SAS modeling, advances will accelerate. Additionally, increasingly engaging decision makers in participatory modeling will increase their awareness of the need for more social data and more generally, the need for resources to support SAS modeling.